Well, hello again. This is Phil Giuliani here on Messianic Lamb Network, and this program is One in Messiah. Glad that you tuned in and glad that you could join us today. And as you know, we're here um, every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time live, and we normally do a teaching and have PowerPoints, and once in a while we interview an interesting guest. And today we have an interesting guest who's making his second appearance, backed by popular demand. <laughs> and uh, rather than interviewing him again, we're going to have kind of a discussion about some things that, that we've been talking about that um, are important to both of us, obviously. And if you remember, I think it was just two weeks ago, we had uh, Brendan Maynard on from Chosen People Ministries. And here he is again. Hi, Hi Brendan. Bill. How are you? Was it two weeks ago you were on? It was close to two weeks ago. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I'm that's happy great. to be back so quickly. Well, that's fine. No, you're you're back by popular demand. <laughs> and um, I, I just met Brendan maybe a couple of months ago at, at um, One in Messiah, and he recently relocated back here after doing ministry in New Zealand with Chosen People Ministries. And he's busy here in the Cleveland area setting up a Cleveland chapter. And although we covered that last time, and we I really want to get to some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, but can you maybe just do a capsule nutshell about what you're doing in the area and how you're setting up and so forth? Sure. So uh, I've been with I've been working with Chosen People Ministries for uh, going on nine years now. Um, a bulk of that time was devoted to our ministry in New Zealand, which was, uh, your, your listeners should definitely check out, um, that ministry from our, from our, uh, podcast or from our video cast two weeks ago, because, um, that ministry was just absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, uh, that got closed down because of COVID and border and immigration issues. And so currently I'm just starting to um, build Jewish evangelism and outreach here in the Northeast Ohio area. Um, and so looking to um, see what the Lord wants to do exactly with that ministry um, in the in the coming years. But we're pretty excited for it. Yeah. Wow. Great presentation. And before actually, why don't you mention now how people can get involved? And then we'll try to mention it again later. Yeah, absolutely. The website at the bottom of the page here is, is my page for Chosen People Ministries. You can contact me. Um, you can uh, see my bio. You can schedule me to speak at your church. Um, one, of the, one of the main things that we're focusing on right now is evangelism training. I think that in our day and age, probably everybody needs a little evangelism training. You know, we should be unashamed of the gospel, as it says in Romans 1 16. And I think that for our time, the preaching of the gospel uh, without trepidation uh, it, and with with the power that we have been promised is is a very important thing to be working. And uh, this is particularly true and also particularly difficult among the Jewish people. So one of the main things we're focusing on is evangelism training related to speaking with your Jewish friends, neighbors, colleagues, co-workers uh, in, a, in a way that is both winsome and powerful. Mm -hmm. Good. And if you live in the Cleveland area, you know, there's yeah. estimated between 85,000 and 100,000 Jewish yeah. people who live in the area. It's actually, it's rapidly growing. Yeah. yeah. So if you live in the Cleveland area, then you most likely do have Jewish friends, neighbors, colleagues, co-workers. Yes. And if you've been to Corky and Lenny's and Jake's Deli and that sort of place, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. We, My wife and I go to Corky and Lenny's and, you know, it's a good, I don't know, 30 miles from our house. But we try to go there at least once a month because it's just fun to hang, go there and eat and hang around. But it's good uh, food. Yeah, this is awesome. And, and this kind of, um, we'll, we'll talk about this again at the end so that, you know, people can help support or get involved or however. And, you know, you bring up a, a great point that I just want to say one couple sentences about, and that is 
preaching the gospel. You know, Paul says, as you mentioned, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. And the culture has tried to make us ashamed of, ashamed of the gospel. And they've kind of penned us in so that, you know, you can't talk about it in public or else all kinds of people are offended. And uh, my wife and I did a lot of work in the pro-life um, movement in Washington, D.C., right on Capitol Hill, right at the Supreme Court and at the Congress. And what struck me some years ago was the fact that we had a, we had up um, the Ten Commandments on stone tablets in front of our ministry center. And the District of Columbia made us take it down because people were complaining that they were offended by by the Ten Commandments. And that's when it hit me that the world was really changing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is offensive in our day and age to say things yeah. like yeah. do not murder and do not commit adultery. And yeah, I think that's that why we need the gospel more than ever before. Yeah. Amen. And of course, you know, we had people that would make jokes. Not that you should make jokes about it, but considering the um, politicians who live in D.C., you know, they don't, they don't want to hear about not lying and not committing adultery. And, not, and no. But anyway, that's, that's, another, for sure. that's a topic for another program. But um, in fact, we had a great street there where we had two pro-life ministries and Jay Seculo's ministry, um, Center for Law and Justice, was like four or five doors away. We were all on 2nd Street Northeast. It was really cool. And unfortunately, a lot of that has disbanded. But that's, again, another, another. we'll do that some other time. Um, but today we want to talk about Messianic Judaism. And before we do, I want to, since I do a program on Messianic Lamb, and since I have a ministry called One and Messiah, and since on Friday nights, and again, I say if you live in the Cleveland area, feel free to come and join us at 709 Brook Park Road, 709 Brook Park Road, which is Calvary Chapel of Cleveland Church. Uh, we rent it on Friday evenings and we do one in Messiah there and we teach correlations of the Tanakh and the New Testament. And we gather about 6.30, we start about, I'm sorry, 6.15, we start about 6.30. So if you wanna pop in and say hello, that would be awesome. Uh, Brendan comes once in a while, but he lives kind of far out but <laughs> but anyway, so everyone is invited and it would be great to see you. And as you know, for those of you that know me and Brendan knows this too, but we'll repeat, when I first became a believer about 27, well, 26, 27 years ago now, 25, I don't know, I can't calculate anymore because I'm retired. <laughs> but um, the first thing that the Holy Spirit did was to put me in Torah. And I was reading Torah and I was making notes and I couldn't really understand it. And I was, you know, one of these people that said, oh, I'll just read from beginning to end. And it didn't take long for me to sit there scratching my head going, what is this about? And as I like to say, uh, my wife got a sixth grade book called the Old Testament. And that I could understand. So that was my first Bible commentary. <laughs> I still have it here in my messy room. And every time I see it, I kind of chuckle. But I was in Torah and I was making notes and I couldn't I couldn't understand in my mind why I, I, I kept getting directed to go into this. And of course, then I started reading other commentaries and made more complicated notes. And every time I thought to myself, I want to read something in the Gospels or the letters, I would feel the Holy Spirit say, go back to what you were just reading in Numbers 10 and read that again. And so I would do that. And then within a couple of years, I got involved in the Messianic movement. And it in that time of looking at Torah, it didn't take long before you realize how everything points to Yeshua as Messiah. Everything points to how he's going to come, what he's going to do, how he's going to do it, how he's going to suffer. And... And as he says in, in John 5, 39, the scriptures testify of me. And just before that, he says, if you believe Moses, you'd believe me because Moses wrote about me and all the types and all the prefigurements and all, I, I don't even know, like all the technical terms to use were just overwhelming. 
And then as I got into the Messianic movement and realized, I didn't know there were Jewish believers at the time. You know, I thought if you were a Jew and you became a believer in Jesus, you went to church, you know, like everybody else. And I didn't really think about it. But then I see the Holy Spirit showed me why I was concentrating on all these things in Torah, because I got involved in congregations and I got involved with uh, the movement in all different places and got to be good friends with Paul Wilbur and the Chernoff brothers and Marty Getz. And I, I can't even name all the Messianic rabbis that have had an influence on me. And so I got into this pretty early on as a believer. And because it struck me at the time that the church, you know, uh, the church as a whole, not every single church, but the church as a whole really had a very poor understanding of its Jewish roots. And you've probably heard the teaching um, from the book of Esther, you know, the kind of allegory of Esther representing the church and the church forgot that she was Jewish. And I always thought that always made an impression on me because the church is very Jewish and the prayers are very Jewish and the worship is even the structure of the church is of a church building is very Jewish and how few people really came to grips with that. Sure. Everybody knows that Jesus is Jewish. I mean, everybody could, Oh yeah, yeah. I knew you were going to say that, you know, kind of thing. But when my wife and I first started doing messianic satyrs at Passover, I was blown away by when you told people that the last supper was a Passover Seder. So many people stopped and said, what really? And I thought, wow, you know, this is a great time for teaching. And yeah. so that kind of launched into this. So that's my background. And we're not going to take up any more time with that. But you want to make any comments on that, Brendan, before we get into some discussion? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, there was a concerted effort in the first few centuries um, to intentionally turn faith in Jesus away from anything Jewish. You know, the Jewish people have always been, uh, for lack of a better term, hated by the nations. Uh, there's always been anti-Semitism among, among the non-Jewish people. And unfortunately, that has infected the church as well. And everybody knows from reading the book of Acts that the first church, the early church, was predominantly Jewish. And that quickly turned through the mostly through the missionary efforts of the Apostle Paul. And the church over the first few hundred years became mostly non-Jewish. Uh, and yet there was still the these people that recognized that that they had a connection to the faith of Abraham, to the promises made to the people of Israel. And uh, that's been completely lost. You know, we celebrate Christmas and Easter nowadays, uh, which are good holidays, but they aren't biblical holidays. And God did ordain biblical holidays meant to point us to those same realities of, of the, the birth of the Messiah, the, the death and resurrection of the Messiah, just like you were saying about Passover and communion. Uh, you know, we've completely torn away uh, our understanding that most people don't even realize, uh, and this is true of Jewish people too, by the way, most people don't even realize that Jesus was was actually a <laughs> Jewish man because we've made him blonde hair and blue eyed. And it, it always is a great shock to see people's eyes yeah. open up when you tell them that the Bible is a Jewish book. Yeah, they may think yeah. that about the Old Testament, but it's actually true of the New Testament as well. And so I'm, I'm, sure, I'm uh, sure you've seen that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm sure you've seen nativity scenes at Christmas with little baby Jesus with blonde curly hair and big blue eyes. Yeah. And yeah. Mary is always there like this, perfectly pristine. And I always yeah. say, throw your nativity sets away because that's not what it looked like. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah no, that's absolutely right. Uh, and so and so most people don't realize this. And uh, and sort of to make matters worse, uh, there's had to have been an answer to the question, what happened to the Jewish people, right? You know, yeah. 
we have the Bible, we can read the Old Testament, it's Israel, 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 Israel. And then we look around us today, and there's no Israel, uh, at least not a believing Israel. All the Jewish people are still unreached to this day. And so that's, for the longest time, that's been a very important question for theologians and for Christians, is if this is a Jewish-based religion, so to speak, then what happened to the Jewish people? Why aren't they following their Messiah? And unfortunately, one of the biggest answers to this throughout history has been replacement theology. And re replacement theology is also known as supersessionism. And what it teaches is that the Jewish people have lost out. They rebelled against God too many times. Mm -hmm. God gave them, God was very gracious with them. He was long suffering with them. But over the course of, you know, uh, a thousand years or more, 1500 years, he, he finally had enough. And the final straw was the crucifixion of, of Jesus. And so all the early church fathers, uh, and even through the Reformation, people like Martin Luther taught that the Jewish people had lost out and that all of the promises that had been given to them, promises for a kingdom and a king and uh, forgiveness of sins and a covenant relationship with God, all of those promises were then transferred to a new people that we call the church. And so this is replacement theology. Um, in fact, I, I came prepared with a couple of quotes from the early church fathers. Um, they taught that Israel had been divorced. Uh, mm -hmm. St. Augustine, who is still commonly revered to this day as an early church uh, theologian and, and father, uh, he taught that the Jewish people were, um, were only kept around, only remained uh, a visible ethnic group on earth as a witness people. And this, this was, he said that they bore the mark of Cain. They were guilty like Cain for having killed their brother, for fratricide, for having killed Jesus. And so God only kept them around to demonstrate to his faithful chosen people, the church, what it looks like when you are obstinately rebellious against God. Uh, he actually said that the house of Israel, which God has cast off, are themselves the builders of destruction and rejectors of the cornerstone. He says that the Lord Jesus distinguishes between his faithful one and his Jewish enemies. Um, and so he, there he is calling the Jewish people the enemies of Jesus. And so I could go on all day with quotes like this. I know that you've heard them, Dr. Phil. I, and, I, have, uh, I have to say that I have to say that I was I mean, I knew about I knew about that. You know, everybody focuses on Constantine who was who has some horrible anti Semitic stuff in, you know, I don't want to say his writings, but you know, he proclaimed grossly anti Semitic stuff as emperor. And you say, Well, okay, well, he's a politician. When I read, I read those quotes from Augustine a few weeks ago, and then actually just last night, I was reading about um, John Chrysostom, the golden mouth, the great orator, the, who wrote unbelievably beautiful theological things, who had just absolutely horrible things to say about Israel, horrible things to say about Jews, about the feasts, and I was quite taken aback. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's pretty terrible. Even even up to uh, up to the Refor Reformation. Here's a quote from Martin Luther, he, and this is from a, a book that he published in 1543. And the title of the book was "Against the Jews and mm -hmm. Their Lies." And in that publication, he wrote, "Listen, Jew, you are aware that Jerusalem and your sovereignty, together with your temple and priesthood," have been destroyed for over 1,460 years. For such ruthless wrath of God, it is sufficient evidence that they assuredly have erred and gone astray. Therefore, this work of wrath is proof that the Jews, surely rejected by God, are no longer his people, and neither is he any longer their God. Uh, 
he's saying that the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 AD and the expulsion of the Jewish people from the land of Israel subsequent to that are proof that God has utterly rejected his people. And yet I wonder what he would say if he was living today when the nation of Israel has again been regathered as a people. Um, so this is this is part and parcel of why the Jewish people remain an unreached people group to this day. The, the gospel has not been preached to them in a winsome or loving way. And in yeah. fact, and yeah. in fact, uh, there's been so many offenses by the church against the Jewish people that uh, the, the amount of damage that has been done has surely contributed to the fact that the Jewish people reject Jesus as their Messiah. And even more recently in 19... 19- in 67, uh, in Vatican II, a doctrine was, uh, I suppose, concocted out of thin air uh, that uh, the Catholic Church now teaches that the Jewish people do not need the gospel. It's called dual covenant theology, and it is a matter of fact that the Catholic Church teaches that the Jewish people are saved, not by faith in Yeshua, Jesus, but by simply keeping the law of Moses and that they have their covenant with God. The church has their covenant with faith in Jesus and um, we don't need to be preaching the gospel to them. And this has even infected some, even or some Protestant denominations as well. Uh, it's really, it's really unexcusable when you, when you look at scripture and when you, when you see what scripture has to say. And so uh, this is a big part of my work, obviously, yeah, yeah. Is, is putting all of this into context, not only for people who are, um, you know, Gentile believers in Jesus, but helping the Jewish people to understand that, that all of this history does not represent the true heart of Jesus, the Messiah. Yeah. Now, the um, um, I did some research into this because I don't know if you're fam- familiar with the movement called Toward Jerusalem Council Two, which a lot of Messianic rabbis are, are involved with, Marty Waldman in Dallas and uh, Mark Kinzer in Ann Arbor. But they, I know them, and we've discussed a lot of this with them, and we've been to Rabbi Kinzer's congregation several times, and he and I. Um, our friends and communicate a lot. And, you know, he, re, he actually referred me to a statement to, a, a I don't know what you call it. A paper is probably not the right term. I don't know what the technical term is, but in Vatican two, there was a, um, a section of it called Nostra Etate, which was about the church's relationship with the Jews. And it was kind of like, um, it didn't say they were saved by their own covenant, but it kind of said, you know, there are elder brothers. We learned the faith from them, and we hope that someday they'll come to know the truth. Was kind of a summary of it. And then, um, interestingly, because I had not really read any of it, and I can't say I've read it in detail. I wouldn't be able to quote it. But um, following that, um, John Paul II and Benedict the Sixteenth both condemned replacement theology and said that the Jews are God's chosen people. He has a plan for them, and that plan has been will be unfolding, you know, in whatever. Yeah. I, I, don't know, I don't know the details, but at least that was kind of hopeful that that you know people were looking at it in a little different light than they had historically. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a little bit of a, um, uh, that hopefulness is a little bit of a, a back door for the Catholic Church. So the document that you referred to, Notre Etate, is, is the document that espouses dual covenant theology. In fact, I've been meeting with a, um, a very uh, esteemed and learned rabbi right here in the local Northeast Ohio area. We've been communicating and meeting for coffee for um, almost a year now, and he actually is a high-ranking professor at John Carroll University, which is a Catholic wow. university, and yeah. uh, he has no qualms about that whatsoever because he understands that they hold this dual covenant uh, mm-hmm. theology that um, that the church may may say that you know the Jewish people are still the chosen people of God. But it also at the same time says that they don't need Jesus. Mm. So it's sort of 
it's kind of going around the stumbling block. Uh, it's yeah. kind of taking this, this as I, as the Peter and Paul quote in Isaiah 8, 14, that the yeah. gospel of Jesus is the rock yeah. of offense and the stone yeah, of stumbling. Yeah, 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 They're yeah. sort of taking that out of the way for ecumenical purposes. You know, replacement theology was so harmful because really you you heard these quotes that I read. They're 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 very dangerous as well as derogatory and dangerous in the sense that that when you reject the identity of a people and say that they are utterly forsaken by God, then uh, that's almost in a sense saying that they're not a, a people anymore and they're not human anymore. And, and we can only see the the effects of that throughout history from the crusade all the way from the crusades to uh the efforts of the germans during world war ii to completely annihilate the jewish people that wouldn't have been possible without centuries after centuries piled up of christian anti-semitism yeah but and and hitler and hitler used those quotes from martin luther quite regularly Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yeah, so exactly. I really do think that there's a bit more of an awakening in our day and age. Uh, clearly, oh, yeah. the clearly the reformation of the state of Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, people who say that it's just a coincidence, um, I think that they're they're intentionally turning a blind eye to to the things that are happening in our day and age. And and so I, God is. I agree, one hundred percent. Yeah, God is doing a really powerful work, and He has not forsaken Israel. I just want to, I just want to read this, you know, because we all consider ourselves New Testament believers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and that we are under the New Covenant, and so the New Covenant is actually found in the Old Testament in the prophet Jeremiah, chapter chapter thirty one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, and it says there that that he is going to make a new covenant. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Now, who's he making this new covenant with? It says it explicitly with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And this is the covenant to erase sins, to uh, offer complete and total forgiveness and to remember our iniquities no more. It's what you yeah. and I claim. Yeah. As our as our greatest reward for for faith in Yeshua, but most people most people read this and replacement theology would say that the Jewish people lost this promise and it's been transferred to the church. Uh, but all you have to do is read the next verse, and it says uh, in verse in verse thirty three, uh, I'm sorry, in verse thirty five, it says. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day yes. and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If, and this is the conditional statement here, yes. if this fixed order of sun, moon, and stars departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. And then it says, if the heavens can be measured and the foundations of the earth can be explored, then and only then will I cast off the offspring of Israel for all they have done. It's as plain as day. I don't think anyone would say that you can measure the heavens. You know, they just launched that telescope uh, this, this last summer, yeah. the James Webb telescope, and they can see farther into space than ever before, but they still can't measure yeah. the heavens. Yeah. And this verse clearly says that if we're able to measure yeah. the heavens, and if the sun, moon, and star are able to uh, relinquish themselves yeah. from the sovereign yeah. control of the Lord God Almighty, only yeah. then will he cast off Israel right. and will they cease to be a nation before him forever. Yeah, so, you, you you beat me to the passage. That's why I was fidgeting with my phone because I was trying to get to that Jeremiah 31, 35 and following because. That's such an awesome, it's hardly ever quoted, by the way. Everybody quotes the first part of 3131 about the new covenant, and that's great. And that covenant really prefigures the gospel, prefigures salvation through Yeshua. Our iniquities are cleansed, and, you know, the law can't cleanse your iniquities, but he can. So it does proclaim that. And then it goes on to say that, 
in fact, Marty Getz has a song that, that incorporates that. And he says it really cool because he says like, you know, he goes through the sun and the moon and the waves and the earth and the, you know, measuring the sky. He goes, if you can do that, then I'll forget Jacob. Is, is there the lyrics of the song? And that's exactly true because if God's promises to Abraham are no longer true, then we can't rely on any of his promises. That's absolutely right. This has I mean, huge if implications. Changes, if he changes his mind, how do we know he's not going to change his mind about what we believe about salvation? How do we know absolutely. he's not going to change his mind about, you know, he may say, well, you know, there's going to be a third testament. We got a new plan coming out in 20 more years. You know, but yeah. Yeah. If if Israel can lose their salvation for yeah. repeated rebelliousness, then what hope do you or I have? That's right. Or or anyone for that matter. Yeah. It, right. it completely undermines the character of God, which is described explicitly as uh steadfast love and yeah. and keeping covenant faithfulness. You know, we yeah. we can actually take great comfort from the fact that God does not give up on Israel and that he does have a plan for them and that there is promised revival for them. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the people you mentioned, you know, the, the fathers and um, Luther and, you know, others, and there's, you know, I've seen people without mentioning any names, I've seen famous people on Christian TV saying, well, the Jews have their own covenant. All the Jews yeah. have their own covenant. You know, we love Israel. We want to support Israel, but they have their own covenant. So, uh, you know that's cool. We don't have to. We don't have to spend time evangelizing them. We don't have to spend time telling them about their Messiah because yeah. they have their own covenant. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, there, there's not a lot of that on Christian TV, but there's some, and there's some yeah. that imply it without saying it, you know, directly. But what I don't get is, and I was thinking about that as you were reading from Jeremiah, and it's it's not just the Tanakh. It's not just the Old Testament that talks about Israel and talks about Jews. The New Testament has plenty of information about what's going to happen to Jews. The gospel talks about it. There'll be the trampling down by the Gentiles till the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled and all the, you know, all, all these things. Then Paul, you know, all Israel will be saved. Um, yeah. You know, there's a lot of references. I don't, you know, I don't have a fun of, but you, yeah, you all probably know them. And then you get to Revelation. And there's 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are preaching the gospel, and and yeah, you, know, you can't even if you say, you know what, I'm going to totally ignore the Old Testament. You know, I don't believe any of that. That's just a bunch of stories, and that's just a bunch of stuff, and God's done with them anyway. Even if you just read the New Testament, you say, wow, he's not done with Israel. Not at all. And and yeah. also, like we talked about uh, the last time, there's a scriptural mandate, Romans 10, 14, and 15, a yeah. mandate to preach the gospel specifically to the Jewish people. That's yeah. the answer for their, their uh, partial hardening that has come yeah. upon them. Exactly. And, and that's where our exactly. ministry comes in. And that's why I decided to put this olive tree behind me, although you can't really tell it's an olive tree. It looks great. Because, you know, people, when, when you quote from, from Romans um, 11, right, about the tree, you know, and you talk about, well, we are, we're wild olives and we're grafted into the domestic tree. You know, people don't want to hear that. You know, we're nourished by the roots. People don't want to hear what's, what. now, like you pointed out, I have to say that, I think there's more and more interest in the church in terms of whatever you want to call it, the Hebrew roots, you know, the Hebrew foundations. Um, I, I think there's more. And like I say, since I've only been in this 25 or 26 years, I can't say how things were 50 years ago or, uh, you know, in my lifetime. But I think that there's more interest. And I think that my experience and, and you've done more teaching than I have. My experience in teaching in churches is that some of these Old Testament passages, these passages from Tanakh that you quote, that you know point to Yeshua as Messiah, and then you, you know, you mentioned the New Testament counterpart of that. 
I can always see people in their seats going, whoa, I never thought of that. Whoa, nobody ever taught me that. Yeah. And so, I, like you said at the beginning, it's it's critical for us to teach these things because, you know, it, when, when, when Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16, he says, all scripture is God-breathed, all scripture. He doesn't say like, well, this chapter is, but this one's not. And, oh, Old Testament, no, 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 certainly not. And this, oh, oh, no, no, don't worry about this. Just concentrate on, no, he says all scripture. Yeah. And, you know, as I, as we've mentioned, and I always point out, if you start studying in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, number one, you miss two thirds of the scripture. And number two is you don't have the total understanding. Doesn't mean you can't be saved. And I don't want, you know, I don't want to get nasty emails. I, you know, it doesn't mean, but you don't get the full power of how Yeshua came, why he came, why he did what he did, why he said and did the things that he said and did, and how those people in that first century context reacted to that and understood these things. We can't, you can't just say, well, you know, it's it's always been like the 21st century, you know, they, they just got with it or you know, they lived in a time where they understood the fulfillment of these things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a it's the scripture describes it as a mystery. Yeah. Why, why did yeah. Israel not recognize the coming yeah. of their Messiah? Yeah. And uh and the short answer and the explicit answer that Paul gives us in Romans is that it's just a mystery. Um, mm -hmm. but that it's part of God's plan. And and you know, um you know, as, as children, we always hate it when our parents, you know, when we ask them why they're doing something and they, they say, because I told you so, uh, we don't like that answer, but you know, it is that way with, with God. Sometimes we don't fully understand, you know, the scriptures say that, um, that, uh, part of the reason that this has happened is so that the gospel would go out to all nations. Yeah. And so and so we understand that one of the reasons that God has allowed this partial hardening over Israel is so that the gospel would uh, be expanded and opened up and available to people like you and me who are far off. Right. Yeah. And that's where, the, that's where the name of your ministry, One in Messiah, comes from, uh, yeah. from Ephesians chapter two. And it talks yeah. about those of us who were once strangers and aliens to the covenant of promise being far off but are now one new man. And this, yeah. I, this, this idea of oneness that is, that is yeah. the most crucial thing, I think, to understanding the, the Jewish question related to the gospel. Yeah. And the olive tree illustrates it just as well. And, you know, uh, if replacement theology was true, then the tree would be completely cut down and, right. a, new, and a new tree would be planted, right? That's but right. that's not what the illustration says. The illustration says that uh, that some branches, because of unbelief, were broken off mm -hmm. and that other unnatural branches, Gentiles, were grafted in. Yes. It says... If you being an unnatural branch can be grafted back into can be grafted in this tree, how much more will the natural branches be grafted yeah. back in? And yeah. that's pointing towards the hope of revival in Israel that is promised repeatedly yeah. throughout the scriptures. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great passage. And then he goes on to say, to paraphrase it, you know, if if their rejection meant life for the Gentiles, imagine what them what they coming to them coming they come into life is going to mean for the whole world that's right that's absolutely right you know it was just uh i was just doing a bible study uh and one of the things that was pointed out was that uh the return of messiah is actually in part contingent upon this revival that we're talking about jesus absolutely. says in matthew yeah. 23 uh when he's weeping weeping over jerusalem he says, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, the, the return of the Messiah, Christ, is in, in some sense contingent upon this revival 
that's yeah. going to happen among the Jewish people. And that's only absolutely. possible with gospel preaching. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And absolutely. so and so in answer to this question, you're fully aware that, you know, uh, in sort of a backlash against replacement theology, uh, that dispensationalism came along. And yeah. what dispens yeah. you're fully aware of dispensationalism, but what it is yeah. for your viewers it's yeah. a it's a theology about Israel that that um, has has kind of always existed within the church. Uh, a lot of throughout a lot of church history, it was sort of a um, a substream. It wasn't the predominant theology. It sort of became a predominant theology among evangelical Protestants uh, in the late 19th century um, after a, a, a brethren man by the name of John Nelson Darby. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. um, published it, and and then it became extremely po popular when it made its way into the Ryrie Study Bible. And so, yeah. um, but the there's actually a problem with this theology. So this theology was a backlash against replacement theology, but and so in that sense, it still said that God was faithful to Israel, but it drew this really sharp distinction between Israel and the church. They were still mm -hmm. two separate people in classical mm -hmm. dispensationalism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, the church was kind of defined as God's heavenly people and Israel was defined as God's earthly people. And there was some overlap, but there, there was actually much more distinction between the two groups than not. And, um, and this, this does not point to the reality of gospel relationship. And so, yeah. and so, yeah. uh, I'd like to. I'm so, happy, I'm so happy to hear you say that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Been, I, well, I've gotten into so many, well, I don't want to say arguments, but um, passionate debates <laughs> about that very issue from yeah. Darby and, you know, starting in the 1830s and by the end of the, by the later 1800s. Boy, it was, it took on a life of its own. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and I've, I've had those, those debates as well myself. Yeah. Um, part of it stems from this idea that the, the church um, is only 2,000 years old, that the mm -hmm. church had a birthday. And that birthday was the giving of the Holy Spirit on, on Pentecost. Um, but I, I actually disagree with that. I think that the church, uh, you know, all of your viewers, um, pretty much all Christians would agree that the church is the body of Jesus, the body of Messiah, Christ. Yeah. And, yeah. and so there's only one way of salvation, and that is to be united with him, uh, to, be, to be united with him uh, in, in his person, in faith with him. And so I understand that uh, I define the church not as a, an entity that was was born um, at the resurrection and ascension of Jesus, but rather um, that this faith in Messiah was fully robustly understood by all of the faithful men and women of Israel, the the heroes of the faith uh, in the Old Testament. That that you know Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, uh, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, Joseph, Moses, uh, wow. all of them, that they understood the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, just yeah. as well as you or I do through a reading of the New Testament. In Amen. fact, in fact I'm, I'm fond of saying that there's actually really, and this is, this is quite true, there's nothing new in the New Testament. Uh, everything <laughs> that the New Testament talks about um, has yeah. already been covered in the Old Absolutely. Testament. So the, the first thing to understand is that the faith of the Old Testament saints was the same faith that you and I share today. It is in the yes. person, even, yeah. even in the life and the resurrection of the Messiah. Yeah, um, and so there is no distinction. Uh, the, the distinction is if you're inside the church or outside the church, if you're saved by Messiah or not. That's the universal distinction of all mankind from all yes. ages. Yes. Are you? Do you place your faith in God as he has revealed himself in the person of Jesus the Messiah, or do you not? That's the yeah. sheep and the goats. That's the division, right? That's right. right. And so, and so, where are the Jewish? There's no distinction between the Jewish people and the church. They are either they are either saved or they are not saved by faith in the Messiah. Um, yes. But yet, 
there's this idea of gospel relationship that I'd like to just kind of talk about for the last couple of minutes here. And yeah, can, I just say one, can I just say one thing real quick? When you say there's nothing new, another thing that people, I don't know if they don't realize it or don't want to admit it or have never thought about it, maybe, but the book of Revelation, which combined with all that stuff we talked about from the 1800s of Darby and which led to all this dispensational thing, the fact that there's nothing new. When you tell people that the book of Revelation, which has contributed to so much of the end times um, scenarios of all kinds, because it could be interpreted so many different ways, people are shocked when you say, you know, the whole book of Revelation, 66% of it is either Old Testament imagery metaphors or direct scriptures from the yeah. Old Testament, from the Tanakh. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, well it's, it's an Old Testament It's an Old Testament book. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I would say that the percentage of, of, of revelation that is directly referencing Old Testament prophets might even be higher than, yeah, than two thirds. It it's it's yeah, it's extremely robustly handling the prophets. Yes. Yes. Um, but to really understand the Jewish people uh and their and their let's say their position within salvation uh i think that we need to understand what gospel relationship is and i define gospel relationship as <coughs> unity with remain distinction that's unity with remain distinction and uh we see this throughout the scriptures and it starts with the image of god and in fact with the trinity itself uh our god who has always existed, who is the presuppositional ground for all existence and all knowledge, is himself tri-personal, and yet he is one God. Within his very person, he is a relationship. This is the most important thing that, that people need to understand because uh, yes. this is how we can say that God is love. God, yes. isn't, God isn't this, you know, uh, cloudy, you know, substance called love. He's not ontologically love. We can say that God is love because he is eternally a father who loves his son and a son who loves his father and shares unity in one spirit. Uh, and this is why it's not a, a scandal to say that God does all things for his glory. I'm sure you've thought this before. Many of your viewers have thought this. When we say that God created all things for his glory, that sounds really selfish. And we kind of think, ah, oh, well, if anybody's allowed to be selfish, it's God, right? <laughs> but God being being uh, triune God is inherently unselfish. Everything the Father does is not for the Father. It's all for the Son and vice yeah. versa. Everything the Son does is to glorify the Father. All of creation is a yeah. gift of this expression of unselfish self-giving love and if there's you know if this hasn't been proved by by the gospel itself that god is a self-giving god then then nothing more could ever be done to prove that so in the very trinity we have this idea of gospel relationship of yes. unity with remain distinction god is one but he is also distinctly father son and holy yes. spirit the and in genesis shema cannot, the shema cannot be violated that's so right. Is one. God is one. That is absolutely right. Eternally in three persons. And, you know, as you were saying that, you know, when, when Yeshua at the Last Supper taught in, in John's gospel, when he talks about the other paraclete coming, he points out that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, doesn't testify about himself. That's right. He testifies of me. That's right. So he glorifies right. the Father. The glor Father glorifies him. The Spirit testifies of the Son. And you're right. It's it's within the Godhead, within the Trinity, which, you know, as I always say, when somebody tells you they understand the Trinity, you know right away they don't understand the Trinity. But, you know, within the Godhead, there are these relationships. And somebody once pointed out that in Islam, you have a monolithic Allah. And so God cannot be love because before creation, he didn't have anybody to love so only, only himself in a singular yes. sense. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we when we open up the the Bible to the very first page, Genesis one, it says that God created. Well, uh, it said that God created man in His image, and it uniquely yeah. it uniquely when God is speaking, He says, "Let us." Yes. Right. Yeah. So right there we have a an uh, uh, an implied relationship of Trinitarian within the Godhead. He says, "Let us." 
make man in our image. And then he says, this is how he made God, man in his image. He said, male and female, he made them. Uh, so somehow the image of God is related to this idea of male and female. And then it says that a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so I understand and that marriage is a uh, an image of God in, in a very explicit way. It is two distinct individuals. They are not the same. And which, is, by the way, is why homosexuality is incorrect, because that's mm -hmm. that's a violation of the image of God, having two of the same trying right. to make make unity out of themselves. No, the, the beauty of it is that they are different, that they are distinct, and yet they become one and they they become one flesh. The Bible says a man and a woman. And when what happens when a man and a woman become one flesh? Life is born. And my children and your children are proof positive that that we have been united as one flesh with with our spouse because they are literally one flesh. Yeah, yeah. And so and then we see this this. So that's more of this this gospel relationship of unity with distinction. But then we and see that, it. Right, and that brings up that begins the whole bridal paradigm that goes through the whole scripture. Absolutely. And so, Isaiah says, so I am your, I am your point, creator have become your husband. The church yeah, is the pride on, on of Christ. that point, right? The the body of Messiah, the church, those mm -hmm. who are saved in Him, God says that He marries us, yeah. and we become and we become unified with Him. And this is this is actually uh, why the birth of Jesus is so important. Many people frame the gospel in terms of the crucifixion and the resurrection. Uh, and if and if that was the case, then Jesus could have just been born as a 30 year old man, gone to right. the cross, exactly. paid the penalty for sin. But yeah. it's actually his very own person that exemplifies our salvation. He is fully God and yeah. fully man in one person. Amen. In his very yeah. own being, he is an example of gospel relationship of unity yeah. with remain distinction. Yes. And and so he he is the marriage. He he is literally the marriage of man and God. He has put on flesh of our flesh and bone of our bones, as Adam said about yeah. Eve in, in Genesis yeah. chapter two. And uh, just to draw this back to Israel, this is the exact type, type of relationship that Jew and Gentile have. Yes. Uh, we become one new man, but we mm -hmm. remain distinct. There is unity with remain distinction. Um for example, when Galatians chapter three says that uh, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, male or female, slave or free, many people who espouse replacement theology point to that verse and see there, look, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Ethnic distinctions have been erased. Uh, and I always point out, well, have uh, sex differences been erased too? Because it says there's neither male or female. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I think we all think that that our our identity as either a male or a female is going to be an eternal reality that will will always identify us. And, and it's the same with the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people. We are unified as one new man and yet remain distinct. And so there is still a distinct plan of God for the Jewish people. And I think we're seeing that unfold in our very own day. Yes. And I, and I think, you know, if you look all through history, even from a non-religious viewpoint, the Jews still exist as an identifiable group of people. And there's very few, I mean, probably the Chinese, you know, too, but there's very few ethnic or racial group of people that are exactly the same as they were 3,000 years ago. Oh, yeah. It's only by God's sovereign, yeah. and sovereign that will. Is, and, and, that what, and that points to what you're just saying. There's a that there's a purpose to that. They couldn't have been, you know, intermarried away, let's say, and then their identity totally disappeared until or because Israel as a people still have to carry out the rest of the plan, still have to be saved, still have yeah. to fulfill his plan that was from the beginning and that Paul points out beautifully and in, in, especially in Romans, but they exist as a separate people. I read yes. a story once where um, when Louis XIV was king of France, I don't know if you heard this, 
And he said to one of his advisors, oh, how do I really know that there's a God? How do we really know? And his advisor said, the Jews, your majesty, the Jews. <laughs> That's right. You know, and I also think of a quote from the author Mark Twain, you know, who wrote yes, The Adventures yeah. of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry yeah, Finn. Yeah. He was actually a well-known atheist and um, yeah. not a friend to Christianity. Right. But he actually observed the same exact thing that you're pointing out now, is that that every other people group throughout history, you name them, any people group, uh, the Egyptians, the Romans, yeah. Uh, yeah. The Chinese dynasties, they have all rose up and fell away. Nice. Uh, and yet the, the Jewish people have remained. And um, while Mark Twain doesn't um, doesn't ascribe this to the sovereign power of God, he does ask the question, why is this? What yeah. he actually yeah. says, what is the secret of their immortality? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to jump know. in because we only have about 30 seconds left. And I can't go over time. Um, <laughs> but before we get off and before you and I even talk about this privately, can you come back next Thursday? Next Thursday. Uh, we'll think about it because we didn't get to the topic we were going to talk about. <laughs> but this was great. This was a great topic. And uh, uh, you know, if you can come next week or the following week, we'll continue. We'll, we'll set it up. We'll set it up yeah, we'll either we'll next up. week or the week yeah. after. That'd be great. Yeah. Well, Brendan, thanks so much for being with us. And I know we'll get together soon and we'll talk soon. And I hope you're going to be back next week or the following week. Yeah, so yeah that would be great. Awesome I really enjoy progress. this. I really enjoy